Welcome to the DFJ Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar Series presented by SDVP, BASIS, and the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, you know, this series is generously supported, as you've heard over and over, by our good friends at DFJ, uh, J. Professor Jefferson. Um, it, you can uh, view us online anytime with this one and any of the others at ecorner.stanford.edu. You can also stay connected with us by following eCorner on Twitter. Uh, that's at eCorner. And I mean, use the hashtag Stanford ETL. I mean, bomb that hashtag right now. <laughs> you can do that. That's totally up, uh, fine with me. So I am Tom Byers, and I have the distinct pleasure of having a conversation with, a, with I am proud to say, a friend of mine, Lorene Powell Jobs. Welcome her, please. Our paths have crossed, and, and okay. she was kind enough to accept my invitation um, last fall to do this. So here we are. Yes. I know. At the time, March seemed very far away, so it was easy to say yes. <laughs> well, she, what's really interesting is I went up on the web, and I started looking around saying, well, you know, I'll see what her style is and stuff like that, because we made this decision to do a conversation mm -hmm. rather than a town hall format, mm -hmm. which many of you are accustomed to here. And I found you did most of the interviews. You do mostly interviewing, not interview. Mm -hmm. So I decided you'd interview me today. Okay. <laughs> so I was born in Atlanta. <laughs> Are you going to be disappointed if this really happens? <laughs> no, Eli's not. He's smiling over there with the headphones. He, he would really like it. He but I got a feeling like 99% are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. We'll just go back to the, what we anticipated. Um, I'm, I'm really happy our paths crossed today with 300 of our friends. And the other agreement we had was it would be a conversation. It, it, and it would be informal. But we are here to inspire, mm -hmm. inform, and to entertain a little bit. Because for the students in the room, we realize it's the ninth week. Yes. It's project so, week. So People are in finals. And oh, damn not close. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so, so you remember to, that? I'm happy to try to be entertaining. So you. So let's go back in your life. What you? Where did you go to undergrad? Uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. What did you? What did you study? Uh, I had a dual major, dual degree mm -hmm. between the undergraduate Wharton School and the Arts and Sciences. So, so I, I, yeah, I remember seeing this BS and BS. E. Yeah, what, that's economics. Ah. So, so the way that that works, everybody gets a BSc, but then you have a concentration, and mine mm -hmm. was in finance. Mm -hmm. And then in arts and sciences, I studied political science, and I also took enough French to have a second major. So, well, let's get a shout I was out to arts. actually amortizing my college tuition dollars to the nth <laughs> degree. Uh, so I, I studied a lot. Well, so let me check in with uh, who's here because we 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 uh, we're a little unusual than coming to speak, say at the mm -hmm. the business school's view from the top. So how many of you are engineering majors? <coughs> okay, how many are you in the business and law schools? Always have a few. Welcome, yeah. welcome. How about uh, arts and humanities and social sciences? All right, welcome, welcome. Mm -hmm. so, good, so it's a good mix. How many undergraduates? Oh, I love it. Yeah. And then at the graduate level. Yeah, so it's a, but it's a split, and then we have yeah. we have others that we are, we're welcome. But uh, everyone here is interested in entrepreneurship. How many people are interested in entrepreneurship <laughs> and innovation? How about entrepreneurship and innovation for some big, hairy problems the world are, are facing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. this is what this is going to be about. So I want to get to that though by just I do want a little bit of your journey. So you go to Penn, um, and. Something happened between there and here. So you went to you went to the business school here. I did. Uh, MBA. I Why did, did you get an MBA? Because this comes up a lot in our office hours, you know. I, you know what? I after undergraduate, I worked at Goldman Sachs in sales and trading, and uh, after almost four years, I took my last bonus and paid off my undergraduate student debt and moved to Italy and read a lot of books that I didn't have a chance to read in those in those four years. And I thought I really wanted, I wanted a little bit more schooling, but I really wanted to understand 
what it was like to be an entrepreneur. And so I applied to Stanford. Stanford was the only graduate school I applied to. So uh, one of uh, your classmates are here. She runs, she's our counterpart over at the business school. I don't know if Leah is here, but that was kind of cool. She was your classmate yeah, there. Yeah, she, there you are. Hi. She is the uh, uh, director of the uh, Center for Entrepreneurial Studies there, uh -huh. so, which we're really close to. So it's, it's, that's, that's a nice yeah. connection. I mean, lo and behold, I, I forgot to mention, she's a member of the board of trustees at this university, which is I am, yes. pretty cool. We, yeah. And um, I'm lucky to say my brother is, so you guys are on that, mm -hmm. um, on that board. Mm -hmm. what, I, I want to just check in with, what does the board of trustees do? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, I, you work really hard, but what is, what is the role here? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a true governance board. So we have governance oversight over the university and the medical center, both. So it's an enormous enterprise. And truly, it, it requires a lot of work because it's a very complex enterprise mm -hmm. to, to wrap your head around. Uh, so um, I think basically I'm your boss. <laughs> You're Leah's boss too, then, and Tina's. Oh boy! No, I'm just kidding. We're actually yeah. not really anybody's boss, but uh, I'm going to work late tonight till five thirty. If that, just, I just want that noted. That will come up. <laughs> um, and uh, okay, so let, let's speaking of entrepreneur, you started something. Let's get at it. Uh, called mm -hmm. College Track about twenty years ago. Did I get that right? You and Carlos. Um, Carlos and I. Carlos and I first volunteered at, at Carmont High School almost 20 years ago. And then College Track was formed about 17 years ago. Okay. Yes. So I, we, I want to run a clip. I don't know if this is the right yeah. way to do it. But could, or you well, want to I, set up the clip? I, happily. Yeah. yeah. At the time, though, 20 years ago, I actually had started a company out of business school. Mm. I did indeed start a company in 91 after I graduated. And I ran that until... 96-ish. But in, in 95, Carlos and I um, went to Carmont High School for what we thought was going to be a one-day visit to a school, and it ended up changing both of our lives. So let's see how. Mm -hmm. I have friends that sometimes they say, I'm going to drop out during high school. I'm like, why would you want to drop out when you can make your life so much better? My parents actually didn't go to college. They dropped out of elementary school to go help. Um, support the family, so they did, they know nothing about higher education. Yeah, I went through college track. I started in uh, my freshman year, so I think that was like 98. Well, my name is Marlene Castro. Um, I am a college track alumni from the East Palo Alto site, and I am now an Oakland teacher fighting for my students. There's hope. There's always hope, especially for someone that is trying to make something of themselves. Uh, my little brother wants to go to Stanford, and. Uh, if for, for those things to happen, you know, they need to have that support. They need to have people that believe in them, uh, be surrounded by uh, this, you know, this whole college track atmosphere in, in order for them to get there. The main thing is that I feel like it's going to happen once again. I have a 14-year-old at college track. I set an example for him, so he wants to go to college, <clears throat> and it's important. My name is Chang Wei Liang, and I am a second year at UC Berkeley. I utilize College Track a whole lot still because the resources are for me to use from, from middle school all the way till I graduate college. College was not even something I actually had in mind but before I moved to New Orleans. I didn't even think I was cut off college. I was the, the guinea pig for our family in the sense of like how to get through high school and how to apply to college so that my younger brother and now my younger cousins can also go through it with my support. Somewhere deep inside you is somebody that wants to succeed is somebody that wants to become more than what they are right now. So this program isn't just here to help the smarter kids, I just think it's smarter. It's to help the kids that are falling behind so that they can get better. I want to go around telling people we can do anything that we set our minds to. Even if it's in a little crowd and I'm only speaking to one person, that one person can pass it on to other people. I want the next generation to see us as the role model because the role models that I had growing up pushed me forward. We're strong role models. So if I'm a strong role model, that means the next generation gets a strong role model. And there comes an even stronger generation, an even stronger generation, so we'll become a generation that changes the world with everything that we do. When I first started College Track, my GPA was 2.0. But Gianna and, and a lot of College Track people, they, they gave me the support. 
They gave me the resources that I need to succeed and my grades improved like by a lot. So my last GPA in high school was a 4.8. And without that, I'd be struggling so, so much right now. You, just, you don't even know how much these people have helped me. College Track is like my family. In my blood, I bleed college track. I think college track has changed my life. I think it has made me get out there and talk to people and tell them, yes, I'm Chicana, and yes, I don't come from one of the best communities or whatever you want to say, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to call it college. That doesn't mean I'm not going to get into Harvard. That doesn't mean I'm not going to become a lawyer, or maybe even president. That's what it means. College track gives us the ideas to do those things. I want to make a difference and impact my community by becoming a lawyer and just showing that we're here and that we have our own perspectives and that we can bring a lot to this country and make a difference. I literally feel like College Track is, um, was at that time and still continues to be a lifeline for how I am able to just continue to find success and be able to define that for people still in my community. I'm not just some other kid trying to go to college. And I want to be somebody. I want, I want, I want to be somebody that people look at and is like, I want to be like him. I realize that I can be that person. Without College Track, I just would not be here today. Does anybody have any goosebumps? I want to be somebody. I know. I want to be somebody. Who is that? Beautiful. Which, 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 which fellow was that? He's a student from the yeah. New Orleans College New Track. Yeah. He's, at, he's at Dillard University right now. So, wow, we could go in a few directions here. Mm -hmm. um, so what does this have to do with entrepreneurship and innovation? Connect those um, dots. Well, it's social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's innovating around a system that's rather intractable and finding those points where, where you can come in with creativity and thought leadership and change things up, in this case, change things up for people's lives and be, be that inflection point that, that a rather calcified system doesn't allow for, typically. Um, so I, had, I started in for-profit entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but when Carlos and I went and spoke to that classroom at Carlmont High School, we met, we met students like the students who are in that video. And um, in fact, exactly one of them, uh, indeed, who became in our first class of College Track, what we found was, though, we, saw, we found such, such a failed system mm -hmm. that it needed kind of an exogenous shock. It needed the the type of entrepreneurship and problem solving that that I was I was doing in the for profit space that I thought what a higher and better use of my life to do it in the social sector. But you brought a, um, an intensity uh, and a flair to it that we typically see it in tech, you know. Mm -hmm. But then it to bring and and just the whole style about it, just the style of that. I mean, there's a bit of theater in that. Because mm -hmm. I teared up the other day, like I was at a watching that that just like I was watching a, you know, a, a nominee for, mm -hmm. for the Academy Awards. So yeah. that you, I think, you appeal yeah, you're to right. my I empathy. Think, um, well, well, change requires movement, and movement requires communications and marketing, and so that's what that's what you're seeing. It it, it happens to also be the truth, and it happens to yeah. be deeply powerful because it's people's authentic words, but it's nevertheless a, a type of marketing. The other thing that struck me, and this is the engineer in me, you know, it's data. I mean, if you go to collegetrack.org or whatever, you know, if you mm -hmm. go, go to the homepage, immediately you see that, and that grabs your heart. 
Uh, but then, you know, I'm satisfied as the engineer below as you set metrics. I mean, you set, you set measurable mm -hmm. goals. And right. there were, they sh some showed up. You actually are over 2,000 already, I think, right? Well on the way. To oh, yes. This think. year this year we're serving 2,000 students, but we have over 200 college graduates who've mm -hmm. gone through the entire program. We started off with a, a high school program that was all about um, sincere college readiness, but what we discovered is when students are first in their families to go to college, they actually need support all the way through to complete college. So then we extended the program to 10 years, so we gave students six years to complete ah, college. Got it. Well, I just like the attention to Well, to so that well, that into there's, there's, there's no way to know if you're actually reaching your goals and affecting the change if you don't collect data. Mm -hmm. So you have to be data driven. The same principles apply in the nonprofit space as they do in the for-profit space. Oh, that's such that's a, that's a really important comment. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because that we we get asked this a lot. The name of our center is the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, and they mm -hmm. say, "Well, that means you don't do social entrepreneurship." And so, I, help uh -huh. help us on this. Um, well, I think I think that. Philanthropy and nonprofit space used to be used to be sort of characterized as a softer space, mm -hmm. but but actually that's not the case at all. Um, with the advent of venture philanthropy and impact philanthropy, people are people are really looking to the space to affect change. And people go, I think everyone in their lives, if they have a notion and a philosophy of what they want to do with their time on the planet. They want to have impact and, and affect change. And the only way you can do that is through metrics and goals mm -hmm. and then strategies and tactics. It's, it's the exact same way that you accomplish anything in either space. Well, today we're going to focus on education and immigration. We're, we're mm -hmm. going to build on that. But, you know, there's another way that we get to hang out occasion, on occasion is Conservation International. I just want to mm -hmm. digress for a minute. That is a large NGO in uh, the environmental space, and um, they're very much science-driven, data-driven. Yeah. And that's what attracted me to them. I don't know why you, you're on their board as yeah. well, and I don't know why you chose that of all the things you could do, uh, but it certainly was mm -hmm. the science that, uh, that know, attracted, attracted you. me. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, their science is impeccable, but their leadership is equally mm -hmm. impeccable. And I think that Peter Seligman's one of the great entrepreneurs in the world. And he happens, uh, you know, I think, to the good fortune of all of us to be in the social sector mm -hmm. and trying to really move the needle in the environment and the climate environment change. Area. Well, but we're going to go after two other, we're going to climb a couple of other hills. <laughs> okay. And yeah. we, we started on that climb by noting our college track and it continues to be, um, you know, scale, continues to scale. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as somebody put it, as we were getting prepped to this, uh, one of your team members said that it, it was a bit of the DNA of what turned into Emerson Collective, which yeah, has been that's true. Um, your, your, your system, your set of processes here in this decade. So can we talk about that? Mm -hmm. So what is Emerson Collective's involvement in education? Um, well, uh, College Track indeed informed and continues to inform um, me and and my my work practice uh, because I get to work with students day in day out and mm -hmm. really hear from them and be responsive to them. Um, I think it would be a big mistake to move away from from that direct service that uh, grassroots impact and, and information that and what age that one gets. Is that, is that K through twelve or it's ten? Well, to so so Emerson is is mainly focused on high school, mm -hmm. though what we see is obviously you can't focus on one part of the system. Mm -hmm. So we've expanded our, our desire to change the entire system, looking at all inputs into both the system and, and what comprises the ecosystem of the public education in America. So, um, so what I mean by that is uh, our system is broken if any, if any students here who've gone through the public education system know, um, as, as the promise of the great equalizer and the preparer of our citizenry, right. uh, it is unfortunately failing because students 
continue to drop out. There are deep inequities in the public education system. Um, there are deep inequities in teaching and learning, and it's based on a notion of time, because it was started 100 years ago during the industrial age when time as a unit of measurement was very efficient. And so people serve the same amount of time in the system, but their learning is variable. We think that should be flipped. We think the learning should be at the high standard and the time on task should be variable. So that changes, that requires system change. So how do you do about that? I mean, well, well, what are some examples? Um, well, we're, um, we have a portfolio of organizations that we support in the for-profit sector, mm -hmm. in ed tech, mm -hmm. in the nonprofit sector, and then we have our own initiatives that we've taken on. So let's do ed tech, because mm -hmm. we, we had um, a, a, one of the leaders of the new school Ventures, yes. venture fund, which you're actually Jennifer on that Carolyn. board. I don't know when you get to No, I'm, I'm, all, I'm only on four boards, oh, okay. really. Um, you just named we, all of them. She spoke in this series recently mm -hmm. and, and talked a good bit. I think it must have been last spring, if I got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so she she took you through sort of the burgeoning ed tech sector. Yeah, and it's it's. It's, it's good. hopping. Yeah, it's yeah, starting it was, to break wide open. It's actually so really, we really about exciting. That? Because I, I think it was a, for those who were here at um, that or, or want to know more, because we got a lot of you know engineering. I think what's in the room. yeah, I think what's really exciting is that it's become a viable market. You're seeing a lot of, of for-profit entrepreneurs mm -hmm. enter the space. You saw a lot of non-for-profit entrepreneurs first enter the space, uh, like yes. Wendy Kopp 25 years ago, starting Teach for America, and then the the 35,000 people that have gone through that have, many of them have stayed, most of them have stayed in the ed sector and they started new schools and they started um, new companies and they run districts and so they have a whole different change mentality. But, but also what's breaking wide open is the role of technology in teaching and learning mm -hmm. has become an incredibly valuable tool and of course actually education is big business. Over a trillion dollars is spent in education each year in the United States and so um, so some of the monopolies that were held by say the textbook industry are, are starting to crack open I think also the the consumers are becoming far more savvy about um, learning uh, you know through technology and so having technology enable teaching and learning and they're willing to pay for it so it's it's an exciting time I think we're going to see massive changes because of that and it and it's I, I'm thinking of a piece I saw that was sent over that you had five priorities that was one of them mm -hmm. and that obviously caught my eye. Yeah, but the way that Emerson Collective works, um, not to get too yeah. too um, wonky in here, but we're rather agnostic about the way that that our capital is deployed. Mm. So we work in this the C three space, which is the nonprofit space, um, and support and. We're really attracted to breakthrough entrepreneurs there. We work in the C4 space, which is issue, issue advocacy. So, so people who are doing grassroots organizing and issue advocacy in states and at the federal level, we mm. support. Um, we support because schools uh, and actually education is political. We spend political dollars based on people who we believe are trying to do the right thing for kids. And then we have for-profit investing. So, so we, we're really so, fortunate so we to actually quadrants. have all sorts of portfolios And then the, on the political with. side, is it local or national or both? I mean, do you, yeah, you, all of them. You, you do because all of them. The, the governance unit for schools is the school board. Mm -hmm. And so you have, to, you have to look at the municipalities, the district level, the state level, and the federal level. OK, so where are you feeling like you're making progress and where are you frustrated? Because um, I know you're going to pu push boundaries, so you know, just pretend like we're sitting here, just we're not listening. <laughs> well, the, I I feel like this is my life's work. So if I were frustrated now, that would be really sad for yes. me. So I'm extremely hopeful, but I, but hope plus work is what affects change, and so we have deeply intellectual work and technical work and organizational work in addition to hope in um, in the resiliency of humankind. And you can see when we get to work with students and we visit schools um, all the time, uh, we visit failing schools, 
and we visit extraordinary schools, both. And yeah. so whenever I travel, I want to visit one of each, or if I don't have time for two, I want to see the schools that are actually failing the students so that it, it recommits me to do this work on behalf of as many kids as I can help. Well, again, in getting prepped for this, I, I had an epiphany. It looks, I think you're in a really rather unique position because you, you understand all those angles or quadrants. I mean, in other words, you understand the nonprofit world, the policy world, you understand the startup and technology world. I mean, you really, you get all of it in your gut and you can get in there mm -hmm. because otherwise, if you want to talk about rhetoric, we're going to get to rhetoric in a moment and partisanship with the immigration stuff. But yeah. in education, there's a good bit of that too, right? You got, well, are you with oh, the unions or not? Much. Like the last election very here much. in California for its, uh, state superintendent of schools. I mean, yes. that got really yes. nasty. Yes. I mean, it was funny. Like, you're, that's where my frustration came from. We were talking about education, yes. and but these these ads were were just intense. Yeah, no, um, well, uh, for some people, the stakes are very high. And when you're part of the status quo and you're protecting your power base, you're going to fight for it. And so that's understandable. Mm. Um, it's also understandable that if people are not satisfied with, with what's happening in our country and with our output, they should fight for change too. And so on the other hand, what often gets lost in the mix is the voice of students. And so, so at Emerson, we, we always like bringing it back to the voice of students, um, really to ask them, you know, is this working for you? And parents, is this working for you? And if the answer is no, then, then actually the, the zero sum and, and politicking that goes on and, and the discussions that are only about what's good for adults is not acceptable. So that's completely compatible with what we teach in our courses regarding entrepreneurship in terms of, if we're talking about for-profit, you know, customer mm -hmm. development. Go, mm -hmm. get out of the building, as they say, you know, and go yeah. talk to customers. Yeah. At the D school, they talk about needs finding. I mean, yep. it, it, is, it is completely compatible with what we're trying yes, to do. Is. Usually using the, the cases being, you know, a tech, a piece uh -huh. of technology, but it's, uh -huh. it applies. Yeah, and it does. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It does. All right, well, let's go to the, the rhetoric. Yes, and, and we'll have time for questions. Yeah, so afterwards. we can come back around so to education. I'm happy but to come we, back around I'm, to education. Yeah, I'm playing time it's cop. Such, I know, but so, it's, it's such a layered and complex issue and deeply fascinating, I think. And so it requires layered and complex solutions. Education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about immigration. Sure. Because that's, you know, the... Uh, it's topical, it's relevant, it's central to our country. And well, so, like topical today's news. I mean, yeah, the, the, in the United yeah. States, because we have a global audience. Uh -huh. In the United States, uh, the, the funding of the Department of Homeland Security was held up over the last week over this particular item. Uh, about the, and, the president's executive actions and immigration. Why does it get so emotional? Well, I mean, um, you, I think you're in, actually, you, you no, if you look at if you look at immigration historically as an issue, um, I don't think there's ever been a time when a group has been let in that they don't want to close the door behind them. And that's just it, it's just how our country has evolved. And there's always been a time where a, a group of individuals has been um, scapegoated and vilified and then finally assimilated and then they become Americans. On the other hand, there's never been a time when, when our economic engine hasn't been fueled by new immigrants to our country. It's our replenishing, it's our refueling, it's essential for the continuation and the continued economic growth for our country. We know this, however, um, People, when people are suffering, they like scapegoating others, and um, and there are some people who are who are serving in the United States Congress who are completely rigid, and there are a few who have a big megaphone who are hate mongering, and it's to the detriment of all of us. Now we have had we have had um, across our country a desire for immigration reform mm -hmm. for years, and at, and it, it both reached, parties. In I mean, yeah. across the United States. Yeah, all kinds and of so, administrations. So at Emerson, yeah. another tool that we use is we do a lot of national and local polling. And mm -hmm. so in this case, we did a lot of polling. 
in districts, in communities, in states, nationally, so that we were informed. Again, we mm. gathered data, we listened right. to people, we did focus groups. I attended focus groups in Arizona and Texas and Ohio mm. and Virginia. And uh, no matter what, the majority of the people, and most of them were Republican audiences, the mm. majority of them wanted common sense immigration reform. Uh, in fact, we have a super majority of Americans who want this. It's not happening right now. We do not have a representative democracy around this issue, and that that needs to change. And so, um, and so we ask ourselves: Well, given given this set of information, how do we actually affect change? Mm -hmm. How do we try to raise the consciousness, raise the awareness, um, bring this to the fore, so that constituents actually speak out to their representatives and say? In this case, because federal policy is the end goal, there's not a lot of mitigation between um, between what we can do as citizens and what the federal policy can do for them. So, uh, so we can de start demanding that they that their votes reflect our wishes. So, um, yeah. so, so perhaps I should just back up. Yeah. The reason Emerson collected yeah, that, how yeah, did you, what, the, yes, what let me drew connect you? those dots for you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, because College Track does inform so much of our work, mm -hmm. um, in 2001, when when our first group of students were applying to college, oh, I see what we you. found that there was a significant percentage of students who were undocumented. They found out at the same time we found out because they didn't have a social security number and they couldn't apply to college. And then, um, then we they couldn't they couldn't fill out the FAFSA forms and they couldn't they didn't qualify for state and federal loans or any kind of funding or grant for their education. And so we had made a, both an explicit and implicit pro, uh, promise to our students that if they followed all these steps, you know, we put together a very robust and demanding program. That, that we would help them get through college. So we had to fulfill our promise, but I started to understand the purgatory that undocumented people you started just people live looking in, deeper in this and, country. And you saw yeah, there were and enormous numbers. Families. And then, yeah. yeah, and then in 2006, um, then President Bush was very committed to immigration reform, mm -hmm. and he unfortunately didn't bring that to pass. We thought that was going to pass. And then we had an opportunity when we had um, both houses of Congress and the presidency, uh, all Democrats who said they wanted immigration reform, they didn't bring it up to passage. Um, so they didn't complete it. And it just, it just became the most shocking, intractable, intractable problem. We had students that are continuing now. I mean, this is an issue that people have started to be aware of for over a decade, and nothing has changed. And meanwhile, we now know, we all know, Millions. we have 11 million people right. who are living in this purgatory. We have, I mean, the conservative estimates are that uh, the, the boost to our economy would be $600 billion over, over an eight-year period. Um, and probably quite a bit higher. Every year, we have 650,000 students who graduate from high school in the US who are undocumented. And, all, and their only option up until the executive action um, was to work in the cash industry. Can we play the video? Now, yes. Good so, time. so yes. So the video that he's that uh, Dr. Byers is talking about is. Um, are you a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I have a PhD, but I'm All not right. that kind of doctor. All right. <laughs> so, so you're you a could professor. Call me you're a professor. Prof yes. <laughs> <laughs> but let's put a face on this. That's so. What we decided to do was uh, we we thought our contribution in this case could be marketing and raising awareness. Mm -hmm. And so we produced a documentary and we built out a website and we um, kind of knitted together the activist communities. And then I'll tell you what we ended up doing with the film. We hired Davis Guggenheim, who's a great documentary filmmaker, and he made a 30 minute film for us that was screened yeah, he spoke on very, campus, very West, widely. West yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh, cool. So can we play so, it? Yeah. yeah. 
It's bigger than a website, deeper than a documentary, more powerful than a petition. It's a story about people. Instead of calling them illegals, let's call them occupiers or trespassers or invaders or squatters. <laughs> Same day that I graduated, I checked my mail and I had gotten a full scholarship. I get a call from the admissions office. We're really sorry, but you can't get your scholarships anymore. I have a degree, I have all this. What am I doing? You can dream all you want, but you're still here. The DREAM Act is legislation that says if you came to the U.S. as a child, we will give you a chance to be legal in America. Growing up, I always said I want to be in the military. He's the kind of guy that our military needs. We will always say, imagine what it would feel like to be told, you know, uh, congratulations. This is my summa cum laude medal. I could be deported in the spring. Am I going to be able to finish this semester? You know, it's, it's real. <laughs> I can't get a driver's license, I can't have a state ID. I qualify for everything. I just can't fill in that space for Social Security. I want to graduate. I want to go to college. I want to be a doctor. We the people said, uh, I believe the phrase was, no way, Jose. If they're not going to listen to us, we're going to go to them. That's how life is. Just got to keep fighting. This really is the future of our country. Yeah, I'm going to be a Marine. This is more than a movie. It's a movement. Upload your photograph. Put a human face to the petition. The time is right. The choice is real. The dream is now. When was that? Just set the timeline. That was 2013. We made that. That 2013, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's a full movie. It, it's 30 yeah. minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah, and, and it, it's a it is a full movie. Um, we screened it um, in the U.S. Capitol. In fact, uh, that was our premiere screening, and that and we had all the students that are profiled in the film and their families there and. Um, a number of, of Congress people came, and then we screened it for the so, some of members of the Republican caucus, the Democratic caucus, um, and the House of Representatives. And then we've screened it on MSNBC. It's on Netflix, iTunes, <coughs> over a hundred. We we put together a college campus screening movement, so we screened on over a hundred college campuses as well. And um, a lot of the the students who are profiled in the film. Um, helped to manage all of the activism in the screenings, and they spoke mm. at most of them. We also have some photos that was from another this campaign. Is another, yeah, yeah so, we, so, so yeah, part of what um, you're showing is different ways. You know, I think it kind of stretches the, the definition of an entrepreneur. I feel like an entrepreneur is nimble and creative and still very goal oriented and tenacious but, yes because you have to be in this yeah. yeah and i think you know you try to you try to do more than you think is possible with with less than do you think given. this is entrepreneurial um, uh, ab absolutely I, th I think it's directly connected to I, it because I, uh there's a lot of headwind there's a lot of forces i mean this this is uh, yeah, you know, swimming whatever metaphor. This is swimming against the tide because yeah. it is it is a grind. So something else that we did as we were pushing for this to happen is um, we wanted to we wanted to have community engagement mm -hmm. um, because all change is sustained by communities. And so uh, we partnered with the photographer Jr. 
and um, we went, we, we fitted out, kind of retrofitted these FedEx buses or, or vans and made them into mobile um, photo booths. And people would show up at, the, at cities. We went to 19 cities around the US and have their, their portraits taken and their, their giant, their life-size portraits that get printed out. And in each city where, where we went, we stayed for several days and we mm -hmm. used a lot of social media and we would paste up um, iconic structures and buildings. And so there are a couple Let's of Let's see photos, a couple of you. Can you do it, that. Chad? This is quite remarkable. Oh, that's, that's Selma. Uh, whoops, whoops, go back. Yep. yep. So yeah, that's, that's in Selma. Uh, that's the Selma Bridge? Mm hmm. Oh, and th those are all And those photographs? are portraits of, yeah, individuals, and they're on the bridge holding it. Wow. And then the next one, Chad, let's have it. This is, yeah. you have to look at that's this. That's a for college a while. campus plaza. I think it's UNC. And just across the plaza, yeah, it was, and there she yeah, is it, walking. Yeah, it was gigantic, that pasting. Well, and I think there's one more. That is, um, so, <clears throat> so that's kind of, well, it's a little hard to see here. Yeah. I don't know if you all can see it there. But um, at, at the end of our campaign, this is in front of the Capitol on the Capitol lawn. And we had, we had gigantic portraits of four individuals. Um, one is a dreamer, one is an entrepreneur. He might have, um, I think he spoke in your class, mm -hmm. or maybe his brother, Patrick Collison. Yeah, yeah, yeah Patrick, he's the founder right. of Stripe. Yeah. John was um, here two weeks ago. They're all think, right? immigrants, um, and then uh, two others, I can't tell who they are. Stacy can tell me. Mm -hmm. And um, they're sort of different faces, different profiles of immigrants in the United States. And um, so you could see this right outside of Speaker Boehner's office, which was right there. Um, we did get in a little bit of trouble for killing the grass, so we had to replant it. But, um, and then, then we wrote up this manifesto. And this is an ad that we took out in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. So we use all different types of media. So what's next? Oh, what's, and what's there's the, one more. Photo. Oh, one more. There we is actually. Yeah, one let's more talk photo, about. It. Yeah, you want to, you want to do that, or I'll, yeah, or then talk about what's next. So, this is this a truly. I like this story. Yeah. So this is a this is a picture of um, Jose, who was profiled in the Dream Is Now movie. I think you saw him briefly. He was showing his diploma from ASU. Yeah. Um, he's a mechanical engineer, and he was he was doing um, construction work. Um, but with the president's executive action uh, in 20, 2012, no, 2013, no, 2012 executive 2012, action. Yeah. yeah, no, we the were parent right. one. Um, right. No, the parent is now. Oh, now, that was yeah. the, that was so the, the kid, original yeah, doc backwards. is 2012, and that was a two year program. Um, he ended up getting, DACA stands for um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So for the dreamers who we were advocating for, um, many of them qualified to live free from fear of deportation under this, but it was only, it was, it's a temporary program. And his renewal of DACA and what's called DAPA, which is Deferred Action for, for Parents' Arrivals, um, is what the Republican House of Representatives was trying to hold up in the DHS funding. Um, but Jose ended up getting DACA status, which means he could get a work permit, and he was hired by Teach for America in Arizona, and this is him in his classroom this year in September. I mean, because when he first got out with his mechanical engineering degree, he was not allowed to work in that profession. It was just go out and be a day laborer. No, no, no. You, is, yeah. you got that no, wrong? You're exactly right, of yeah. course. You couldn't get a work permit. Yeah, so that, that's what he did, it was just day labor. He was labor. in construction. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fine line between you know those of us sitting in the room and, and that. Um, yeah, a really of fine line. No, that it's it's all of our story. So, do you want to take questions? I think we better because yeah. I've run yeah, out. Much. <laughs> I don't think anyone believes that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have some hands. Um, how about right here? We'll kick, kick off with you. Speak, speak up. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> so, um, really inspiring stories with all these kids. Uh, my wife and I run a small nonprofit that's a horsemanship program. We teach a lot of younger kids. 
And one of the things we see that really makes a difference, particularly with the kids with special needs, is that they're so often told, so often told what they can't do. And in my experience teaching at, uh, at the Computer Clubhouse for Kids, with farm worker kids, similar kind of problems. They're all, they don't expect the colleges for them, it's for other people. Do you see, how do you see that playing out? And how, do you have any stories of some of these kids changing how they think about themselves? Um, yes, we have, a, we have many stories with college track students. Um, over 90% of college track students are first in family to access any higher education. And um, so 96% are first in family to go to a four-year college. And um, because you don't have that tradition in your family or in your community, um, if you don't get it from your school, you're not the encouragement, the high expectations, um, that role modeling that you see yourself in, you're not going to get it. And so th we, have to, we have to make this change student by student, classroom by classroom, family by family, school by school. Um, and that's, that whole culture and mindset is, is right at the core of the change that needs to happen. Uh, let me see if I can get, I want to see, get a student far back right there. Yeah, that's you, yeah. Uh, hello, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, so we've already established the work that you're doing is entrepreneurial in nature. And as every speaker before you has spoken that that's really hard work, it requires a lot of sacrifices. And in part, that's at least to some extent compensated by financial incentive, the fact that you might make you big and have a lot of financial payout. But the kind of work you're doing does not have that at all. As a nonprofit, you're not able to make that set of money. So how do you fit this entire thing into a picture? How can we how can we change so that more people actually can make that decision of working really hard towards problems that may not pay off in terms of money? Um, you know what? Social entrepreneurs generally don't make a lot of money. It's true. They just don't. Uh, there are intrinsic rewards that are off the charts. The extrinsic rewards are limited. Um, I think you know you. What I'm seeing in this sector, though, is um, is a very, very healthy living, but you're never going to get the kind of you know, breakthrough and and wild upside that you see in the for-profit sector. It just and so you have to reconcile yourself to that and be willing to make a fine living, but maybe not maybe not have the kind of wild financial success that you can have in the for-profit sector. Now there, that's one, that's one, that's actually reality, right? But then what if we thought, okay, what if we really wanted to incent the best and the brightest to go into the social sector to, to, um, to affect the kind of change that is required there? How could we think about this differently? What if we had a startup fund that, uh, social entrepreneurs got shares in that, um, say, all the VCs in Silicon Valley contributed to? Um, what if some established companies put aside some sort of bonuses for people who, are have, who have breakthrough change ideas or who are equipping communities to be agents of their own change? I mean, there are a lot of different ways we as a society can start just changing up the financial rewards so that it can, it can become a much more exciting, from a, from a financial point of view, exciting career path than it currently is. Um, to me, there's no work like this. There's no work that gives me the level of reward that, uh, that one gets when, when you see like the students who you saw in the college track video, students who finally understand they can do anything they want with their lives. That's, that's a tremendous payout. But financially, I think we need to reorient as a society a little bit so that there's more of an alignment. Well said. Uh, right here. This is more about your career. You as a woman, um, have you ever faced any limits or any barriers in society when you enter the world of finances? Or how do you achieve them? How do you jump? Like from them? Um, well, when I first started out on the sales and trading floor in fixed income at, at Goldman Sachs, I, there were 
10% women on that trading floor. Now, I was lucky because I grew up with three brothers, so I was used to just being surrounded by men and boys. And so uh, it wasn't all that different from my kitchen table when I grew up. But um, there were plenty, I mean, it was not for the faint of heart. It was not for the thin skin to be on a trading floor. Um, there were plenty of times when there were terrible things said to me about other, you know, all sorts of things. Has it uh, been changing? Like, from you know, I've been out of that industry for a long, long time. I think the world has changed a lot. I think there's a lot more acknowledgement and sensitivity and uh, probably there's still a lot of machismo on a trading floor. I haven't been on one lately, but uh, but I think you know, I if there are other compensations. If if you go into if whatever career path you take, you can actually not be surprised. You can actually kind of try things out. You can you can shadow people. You can get a sense of of the culture in different sectors and industries, and you have to see where you feel most comfortable. Thank you. How about right here? Hi, uh, my name is Emerson. I'm actually oh. a net tech oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually you a net tech engineer, that. and I'm an immigrant on a visa, so I love what you're doing. Oh. <laughs> All right, Emerson. I'm going to have to get his my contact. Qu my question is on the uh, higher us. education. Of course, we all know that it's broken. You mentioned it. Uh, and I know like academia hasn't changed in a while, and it probably won't. So what is something that we can do as ed tech entrepreneurs without the support, full support of academia that can actually move the needle and really support uh, students? In higher ed? Is yeah. You're asking about higher ed? Yeah, because I know in K through 12 right now, because the teachers are younger, they're starting to adopt technology a lot easier than in higher education. So th yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point of view. I, and um, at Emerson, we just met with Carl Wyman, who many of you may know. Um, he's a, a, a joint professor at the ed school and in the physics department. And he's here at Stanford. And he is a treasure. He's a Nobel Prize winning physicist. But he's so deeply committed to changing up uh, how um, big lectures are taught in science and how science is taught in yeah, higher there's ed. There's a lot and, of work going on here. Um, and he's working with the faculty. And so you should go meet with him right away. He's wow. really interesting. I think also um, the, your dean, um, the dean of engineering, is incredibly creative and innovative and is really looking for ways to change up how um, education happens in the This is where you school. asked me about Epicenter, though. Also, I believe you have a program called Epicenter. Yeah, yeah, thank, gosh, thank you. So come see me or anybody across the hall where we're working on uh, changing uh, faculty and students in colleges so that everybody gets to learn about entrepreneurship and innovation. And we're, we're doing that on, in a systemic way. Thanks for oh, yeah, teeing me up on to, that. I'm Epicenter. happy to give you a Okay, uh, right here, another student. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering how did you decide to focus your project in this specific uh, part of the population? I mean, why did you decide to work in improving the, the education in, with these specific characteristics instead of focusing in any other thing? Um, well, it, it the genesis of my awareness and awakening came just from visiting a classroom in a local high school by chance. Um, I went, a friend of mine and I were asked to go and speak to a high school, this was 20 years ago, to a class. And these were a class of students from East Palo Alto, which is right next door to us. And they were seniors in high school who had been told that they were, that they were in a college prep course. Um, and the teacher had asked us to speak to them about college in general. Uh, and, the, and the teacher had explained to us that at this high school, Carmon High School at the time, there were 1,700 students and there was one college counselor. And so she said, unfortunately, no one in my class has gotten to see a college counselor yet, so we'd like you to come and speak about college. And so we said, we'd be delighted. And we came in and what we found very quickly was that of the 35 students in the class, three, as seniors, three 
had taken the required courses to even apply to a four-year school. So 32 couldn't even apply. And when I found that out, I decided that this was such an abomination and such an injustice, and it was happening right in my backyard that there was, I could do nothing but devote my life to trying to understand why this happened and what I can do to change it. So all your inspiration for the project was because of that visit in specific? It really was. It really was. I guess you know, sometimes in life you can really pinpoint the moment when things change for you. That's a great question. We like asking that of people. Uh, Tina taught me this question. Three words, what motivates you? And I meant mm -hmm. to ask you that question at both segments of our mm -hmm. discussion, the one about education and one about immigration. So I'm going to take the last question, though. It's not okay. that one. Thank you for helping me remember that. This is dial back time. You are at Penn. You're 20 years old. What would you tell yourself? Oh. Right now. Yeah, you're out here. You're, you're, you're back in pen. You're sitting in some lecture. You no, know, I would say, I would tell myself to have faith. I think I was, I, you know, I, I was a middle class kid. Um, I, was, I went to a high school that did not adequately prepare me for college. I worked really, really hard academically, and I also had a work study job, and I had a job outside of work study. And, um, and, I re and I was not relaxed. I had a lot of student debt. I, mm -hmm. had, I was um, financially independent. And I had a lot of pressure. And I think um, I didn't allow myself to think expansively about my life because I, there were exigencies that needed to be attended to. Um, but I, I always had sort of big dreams. You know, I, I was always so intrigued and enchanted by social movements, but I didn't think that I could do that because, you know, back to the first student's question, mm -hmm. I actually, you know, financially, I really needed to figure things out. And um, I think I would tell myself to relax and the time would come because if I stayed true to myself, the way that life evolves, you end up getting to do what uh, you think is your highest and best use. Did you have a good time? You mean now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did you have a good time? Oh, thank you so much.